Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's exciting to be online with you today. And we're excited to be part of this session at the Global Digital Health Forum, where we get to talk a bit about the impact of embedding user experience design and really looking at the practical results and return on investment with modern design thinking uh, as a central to the global goods development. So I'll be your facilitator today. Today, I'm Carl Furry. I'm the Deputy Director of Global Goods here at Digital Square. Uh, for I'm based in South Africa, and I spend a lot of my time working in the global space, looking at facilitating investments into global goods and advocating for them to be part of uh, conversations that are impacting the changes we want to see in the world. So I'm going to take a few minutes and give uh, the panel that will be part of us today to a moment to introduce themselves. Uh, Grace, over to you. Thanks so much, Carl. My name is Grace Platma. I'm Director of Product at OpenMRS. My background is uh, originally as a registered nurse. I specialized in emergency and critical care, and that led me to an interest in using software to make life better for our end users, which is how I became a software product manager in healthcare. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks, Grace. Nicole, over to you. Hi, everyone. My name is Nicole Orlowski. I'm with Medic, and I am a product designer. Uh, I have always been a product designer, so <laughs> uh, it's been a journey. It's really exciting to be in the global health space. Um, and within the team at Medic, I spend a lot of time talking to users and uncovering pain points so that we might improve uh, our community health toolkit. Thanks. Thanks, Nicole. Great to have you online with us today. Joe. Hi, everyone. My name is Joe Amlung. I am a product owner with the Open Concept Lab, or OCL group. I also am a business analyst with the Regan Shreef Institute based in Indianapolis, Indiana, USA. Uh, my background is in public health, but I have started specializing in terminology management in the past few years, and I primarily focus on breaking down the barriers to getting started with what is often a complex topic. So glad to be here. Thanks for making time today, Joe. And Roger, across to you. Uh, thanks, Carl. Um, so I'm Roger. I'm the head of design at Ona. I'm also a co-founder. So here I lead a team of designers, product owners, and product managers who are responsible for defining what we build. Um, I'm based in Washington, D.C. Fantastic. It's really exciting to have such a wealth and depth of knowledge and experience on this panel today. And we're looking forward to hearing a lot more about your experiences in each of your organizations as you've taken this challenge and hopefully have some great learnings to share with us. Just an outline for everybody to level set what we're going to be going through today. There are a few questions we're going to be diving into to really get our panelists experience out in the open. I think of it as painting on a blank page and trying to see what that canvas looks like at the end of this. Uh, so we're going to ask each of them to walk through a dramatic moment uh, that'll really share why this is such an important aspect to that to them. Uh, each of them also to share from their perspective, like what does design thinking mean and you know, how has it impacted their process? Uh, why are these hard? And we're going to hear about the user experience journeys of each of these organizations. And hopefully through this, each of you uh, watching and being part of this presentation, uh, both virtually and here in the room, We'll have an opportunity to see how this plays out in your organization or learn from areas that you could apply in the way you look at the world. And that brings us to the last point, which is really those practical take home examples. So I think kicking us straight off here is what is each of your dramatic moments? I'd love you each to just take a moment and share a story where you realize that there is a need for embedded design thinking in your organization. Uh, and for sake of order and clarity, we'll just start from, from Grace as you go ahead, please. Thanks so much, Carl. So yeah, dramatic moment that we had. And this will tie into my tip at the end as well. Um, a few months ago, we were doing some user shadowing and user testing in Western Kenya uh, with a number of community members from different organizations. And uh, we have been doing quite a lot of user testing over Zoom during the pandemic as well. And we were about to walk into a room to interview a clinician who we had been shadowing earlier in the day. But he said, actually, can you guys just wait one moment? I, I, I'm busy doing something. And we noticed his screen. We said, that's not OpenMRS. That's a spreadsheet, uh, a Google sheet, in fact. How are you using that Google sheet? Uh, and so because we had been there in person, uh, we managed to learn that there were a whole host of problems that the whole organization was having that they were using a spreadsheet to manage instead of the EMR, even though it was a good fit 
for the EMR. It's just that we were missing that pain point. And uh, even our field team on the ground had not identified that. Uh, and that's that's a great example of why it's so important for anyone and everyone to have a whole organization culture of going to your users, spending time with them, seeing their problems firsthand, because you'll always learn something that you wouldn't have learned otherwise. Thanks. Thanks, Grace. I think there's a lot in that in terms of the value of being in the field and seeing things and bringing it in. Uh, Nicole, from your side, as with the medic team, what is something that stood out from you in this space? So for me and medic, um, the word dramatic doesn't necessarily resonate because design thinking has always been a core part of our process. And we go through several iterations of what that looks like. Maybe not several iterations, but we iterate on our process uh, when it's not working for us. So our most recent alignment to embedded design thinking uh, was the real or came from the realization that our product team was still too far removed from our users. So in the past, we've designed solutions that didn't yield substantial impact and have found the root of that to be that we were aligning our efforts with customer requests over actual user needs. So the situation reminded us that our customers aren't our end users. And so we've reevaluated our process and now have small and frequent touch points between our product team and our health workers directly. So it helps us uh, keep a pulse on their timely needs. And we're also striving to release smaller and frequent updates to the CHT than, rather than larger um, features driven by non-user stakeholders. Thanks, Nicole. And that's something that I think is quite prevalent in our field is often the users and the key stakeholders are two separate groups and something that we should all strive to keep more in mind. Uh, Joe, from your perspective with OCL, what was that dramatic moment for your teams? Yeah, so uh, in our experience with OCL, we had been kind of operating for quite a few years with just our te our technical, our backend API up and running, and then we had thrown on a user interface that people could do these technical things without having to actually access, you know, API JSON and do all this fancy technical stuff. But when we would send people in, in into this user interface and say, all right, here's how you can go through your workflows and things like that, it, it wasn't sticking. And as a result, people would uh, even dedicate time and resources to designing or even sometimes developing a front end UI that would better meet their workflows. And so it, it kind of hit us after a while. It's like, well, this is uh, not an efficient use of resources if our tool needs people to constantly put a new front end on it to make it meet their needs. Instead of just having a user interface that lets you do technical things, it should actually help you with the workflows and empower the users to use them in their actual use cases rather than developing their own tool to make their to make good use of this. That, that's definitely quite a stark ice bucket moment um, to have a look at that challenge of coming through, but one we can all relate to of uh, having to take that moment and realize that there's time to rebuild uh, and look at things effectively. Uh, Roger, from your team's perspective. Sure, yeah. Um, I guess we realized design thinking would be pretty important, I guess, uh, early on um, at Ona, where you know I was a sole designer and we started getting overwhelmed with projects uh, with con contradicting needs and timelines. I think there was a period where you know I went to Kenya and Uganda and I think Dhaka, and there's just all these workshops and all these people asking for things. Um, and so I think, you know, just being overwhelmed with stuff, it caused us to make reactive kind of spur of the moment design decisions versus like the collaborative ones that we wanted to do where we researched. Um, and it was really complex because these, these groups, you know, there'd be all these stakeholders with kind of final say, you know, product owners, ministry, district health people, donors, subject matter people. And that um, caused really a lot of complexity. And I was coming from a background at, at Frog Design, where I was a designer, um, used to having just like the executive suite and customers and just thinking about that. So, you know, I think that's when we realized we had to kind of treat everyone kind of as a user and as a stakeholder that we had to kind of, that was a design problem in itself to solve. Um, so, yeah. Fantastic. And thanks. You, this is not the first time we've also used uh, the word design thinking right now. Uh, and one of the questions I have about this is 
what is what do these terms mean to each of your organizations? You know, design thinking and the product team process. Uh, maybe you can help at level set for the organization to uh, listening and participating. And for mixing it up, let's just go in reverse order. Roger, since you had the mic last minute, hand back to you and, and we'll take it from there. Sure. I think um, design thinking at ONA is really about empathy and empathizing with, with all the stakeholders. And really, more importantly, I think, empathizing with each other. I think a term we use at ONA a lot um, throughout the process is shared agreement, which is really about focusing on figuring out what we can build together with our clients and partners and internal team. Fantastic. Joe, anything you want to add to that from your team's experience with that concept of design thinking and the process within the teams? Yeah, absolutely. For us, design thinking is about bridging the gap between a technical solution and a real world solution and making sure that uh, we're not just putting these difficult to understand tools like we need to help people get started right away. We don't, it's not sustainable to be training people in the long run to how to use a tool. It, the tool itself should guide the user on how to be successful in it in whatever use case they have. So we are working hard to make sure that can be reflected in OCL and in our other partner products. Thanks, Joe. Nicole, from your perspective, and you said something exciting a little early on, that this has always been something that's been part of the medic process. So you know, what does it mean in the medic team? So for us, design thinking is really understanding the problem you're trying to solve for whom and in what context. And with medic, like the community health toolkit is so configurable that that could mean a lot of things and just understanding the different ways that people are configuring things to work for their own programs can be quite challenging to understand. So design thinking really is just like, who, what is the problem we're trying to solve? Who is it for? And what are they using it for? Or how are they using it to um, help their costs? And also part of design thinking is to measure and iterate. Um, these are sometimes things that can fall off the radar when you have so many things going on that like, and you release something to the world and you're like, okay, that's done. What else is next? But we make it a practice to never release something without telemetry or something that we can see that, oh, did this solve the problem? So that's asset medic. That's, I, that's a great point. We, we often, we don't measure it. We don't um, look at it. We don't monitor, we don't change on things. And I love that, that you guys are bringing that particular aspect out. And I think that is definitely something we should all be thinking through. Grace, as you've had the privilege of listening to everybody um, share what, what design thinking and the, the product team process is, you know, how, how much of this is what you guys are doing in OpenMRS and what does that mean to you? Great question, Carl. So there are two aspects I want to focus on. On the one hand, uh, we've been very fortunate to have this cadre of uh, professional designers join uh, Open MRS, um, specifically from Slander Collective. And one of the mental frameworks they've been adjusting for our whole community is thinking about design not as the wireframes and the style guide or your UI components, but as an entire mindset that can be applied throughout the organization, whether we're talking UX or service design or how the organization is set up or how we set up our strategy. Uh, and then of course that applies in the field as well. Are we using design only to design solutions or are we also using design methods to identify the problems? Uh, so our, our colleagues have been bringing in a lot of um, frameworks, and you'll see, and Nicole will walk us through some of them uh, in, in her journey at Medic, uh, different frameworks and, and workflow assessments uh, exercises you can do both in the field or with your, your team centrally to better understand problems themselves before we dive into the solutions. Um, now, in that same vein, uh, on the other side, we have this product team thinking. And I want to emphasize that word team. In uh, many cases, our history has sometimes been primarily engineering driven. Uh, and when you look at a typical um, modern day software shop, you usually see this uh, tripartite team, which is you've got your design designer, 
uh, you've got your product manager and you've got your engineering lead. And this is really, this is the team. We are together a product team. No one person is the leader uh, of the product. We, we, we build this collaboratively. And that's a mindset that, uh, that, that we're still working on, uh, how, how we, how we make sure that engineers are involved in the design process, even at the point of identifying what are, what is the problem we want to solve, like Nicole alluded to, um, because we find that when you involve engineers at the end, uh, only for the engineering side of things, you'll realize that not only are your designs maybe not feasible technically to build, but um, you have actually missed out on a lot of ideas about what might be possible uh, versus hard to do from your your engineering team. And the same is true. Uh, many managers, program managers, project managers, product managers, we feel like we have to do everything ourselves. And um, that actually detracts from our UX and UI design colleagues, where if they can learn more about the industry context and the problem context we're trying to address, that often changes how we end up approaching the solution. So this goes way beyond, here's some wireframes, have a nice day, I'll add it to the JIRA ticket. <laughs> Thanks, uh, you're, you're calling me out on my history of just doing something like that. So I've got some good notes to take out of this particular session. Uh, actually, what's a nice moment that I wanna dive into right now is I know each of you have had a journey within each of your organizations of taking this on. Um, so probably a good time for us to dive into that particular space uh, and look at what is the user experience journey uh, for the OpenMRS team. And Grace, I'm gonna, since you've had the mic last again, uh, we're going to hand back to you to walk us through this space. Thanks so much, Carl. So yeah, let's walk through what's been going on for OpenMRS in our design world the last two and a half years since the pandemic kicked off. Um, well, first of all, when COVID started in 2020, we uh, became very aware of a problem that had grown over the last few years in the OpenMRS community. And that's that even though we were all using the same overall platform and backend and data model, most of our implementers were using different uh, front ends, which meant that when it came to building applications together, well, we couldn't because each front end was often using a different tech stack as well as a different UX and UI. So uh, we've started investing much more heavily in UX. Um, and one big reason is that frankly, it's more efficient and less expensive. And this was actually researched um, by IBM and others over the last uh, couple decades. And it's called the one in 10 in 100 rule of change. And this is the idea that it's cheapest to make changes during your initial research. It costs about 10 times as much to make changes once you're in the design uh, UI phase. And then it costs 10 times as much again in order to make late changes at the engineering phase when the engineers have already done or are doing development. So earlier is better when it comes to making changes. So this is the OpenMRS RefApp version two. Uh, you may have seen it before, RefApp being our reference application. But this is our future, the OpenMRS app version three. Uh, what's exciting to, about this is uh, the modern look and feel. We've designed it to be tablet first uh, with more visuals. And it's also built on technology called micro front ends that allow different people to work together on different applications and pick and choose what they want to use in their implementation. Now, UX and UI have been a really big part of this project, and we've been building a collaborative process around how we add features to this new EMR product front end. You'll notice in this process diagram that long before we uh, get the reference application or demo product out the door, there's a lot of pre-development phase work in the design phase. Why all of this pre-development work? Well, because of the return on investment uh, visual that I showed you earlier about how it's much cheaper and more effective for the whole team to make sure that we've asked questions and gained context before we start creating mock-ups or even the architecture itself. So uh, why do UX? Well, investing in the right problems. Um, for example, uh, when we talk about registration, one of the first things someone might do with the EMR, we often think about, okay, you've got a registration clerk, She's she might be sitting at a laptop, um, uh, and she might be entering something into uh, a form, we need to give her a form. But 
if we actually look at the entire context of this staff member's experience, you'll notice that all around her, she's swarmed by a big waiting room full of people. And so it's less about needing to register a patient and perhaps it's more about needing to get people in and through the center as quickly as possible so that they are not delayed in getting care. So with our design, did we actually solve the user's biggest problem? And if we don't know the user's biggest problem at the beginning, how can we solve it at the end? So um, this year, we've been doing a lot of site visits, workflow shadowing, user acceptance testing feedback, and user interviews. Obviously, during lockdown season, we were doing this over Zoom, but it's been really exciting to meet colleagues in multiple countries, multiple languages, and experience um, uh, what their workflow is like. One example of uncovering a bigger pain point has been um, dealing with patient lists. So for example, uh, we heard from a requirement gathering team, okay, we need patient lists in our clinic. Great, no problem. So uh, we worked on a design together to help uh, staff see patients in a list and to filter that list and so on. But then when we went into the real world uh, in a deeper dive workflow shadowing, we discovered there was a deeper need that users really needed to quickly switch from one patient to the next because the queue was so long and every moment in between seeing one patient or another mattered. So here you can see the design that came out as a result of that process. So now not only do we have patient lists, but we're baking them in to the chart experience so that it's fast to switch from one patient to the next when the moment requires. So that's one example, but we've been working through quite a lot of different questions over the last two and a half years of working on the OpenMRS3 project. Things like, how do users expect to navigate through an EMR? How do users expect to care for a patient um, or groups of patients and other paradigms? And you can see more information about these questions we've been asking and some of our findings at the link on this slide. One discovery has been that structuring design tools themselves can expedite development. And there are three key tool decisions we made in the last two years that have helped us carry forward the return on the investment we're making in UX. The first was leveraging an open source design system. We are using IBM's open source carbon design system. And this has many benefits for us because it is maintained by a dedicated open source community. It has thorough documentation, many workflow examples, clickable prototypes, uh, and code samples as well. We've also been investing in design documentation specific to OpenMRS and how we're leveraging the carbon uh, design system. So for example, we have new UI pattern documentation using a tool called Zero Height, which is publicly available online for implementers using OpenMRS to see how does the OpenMRS design system recommend that I structure drug information, for example. That's something that uh, Carbon does not automatically cover, but we still need to lay out the patterns really clearly so that when different organizations and community members are building new features in O3, it's clear what precedents have been set to follow so that we can continue to maintain things uh, together and have less risk accordingly. And finally, making a structured and easily available design inventory for dev handover. We use a tool called Zeppelin, and it's basically a repository of all of the work that designers are doing to get uh, visuals ready and into the hands of developers. And many of the pieces of the designs link directly to, for example, our component library or our style guide. Here you can see an example of a design, uh, and Zeppelin allows us to easily toggle between the large desktop mode, the small screen mode and the tablet mode so that it's easy for the developer to see how do these different aspects of the page uh, need to respond if the screen size gets smaller for the specific design. And overall, this has had a big impact on developer experience. It was a highlight for me to hear developers in our community saying things like, Using this new carbon design system makes it much faster to build new features. It's clear how things need to look and function. There are code examples if I need them. I don't need to waste time talking about what pixel spacing to use here or there. And I can focus on building things, which is what I like most. At least this is uh, the experience of, of some of our community developers. 
But perhaps most importantly, this has helped unlock our sustainability model at OpenMRS specifically, where increasingly our model is that by pooling the dev resources from multiple organizations, we're able to get more feature work done together. And that means more efficient use of valuable development funding. So in summary, why invest in UX? Because it's more efficient. We focus on the right problems, we make changes at the right time, and we build things the right way, which at OpenMRS means building things together. Thank you. Thanks, Grace, for walking us through the journey from an OpenMRS perspective in terms of uh, what you've had a look at from that space. Uh, continuing with our panel and moving it on, uh, Nicole, we're going to hand across to you to take us through you know, what the medic team has done in this particular space. Hi, everyone. My name is Nicole Erlewski, and I am the product designer with Medic. Medic is a steward of the Community Health Toolkit, which is an open source and highly configurable framework for building apps for health workers that provide care in the world's hardest to reach communities. Today, I'll be speaking about our UX and product process, specifically the continuous discovery methodology and how we apply it within our team to improve the Community Health Toolkit. Continuous discovery, in a nutshell, is a research methodology where product teammates continually search for new information about users and their needs by conducting small and frequent research activities through regular touch points. How we work is that our product team is divided into focused working groups, each servicing specific personas, with each working group usually comprised of designers, developers, and product owners we conduct generative interviews with respective users on a weekly basis. So the beginning of our UX journey begins with listening. We usually ask the last time our interviewee has used the CHT, what they did, how they did it, and some more general questions about how they prioritize their time and their work. This helps our team keep a pulse on timely user needs and to also gain a deeper understanding and empathy with our users. When interviewing our more technical users, such as app developers and technical partners, we can assume certain things like that they have access to sufficient connectivity and a level of tech literacy that even allows for remote usability testing. However, when conducting interviews with community health workers, there can definitely be challenges. Outside of connectivity and battery issues, one of the most prevalent challenges we face are language barriers. If we don't have a medic teammate who is able to call and speak to a health worker directly, we arrange for local research assistants to help facilitate the process. This requires a training of interview skills, as well as a commitment to transcribing and translating for us. This does come with an upfront cost, but one well worth the investment to ensure we're building equitable solutions. So now that I've covered how we do it, I'll move on to what we do with these interviews. Each member of the focus group, again, designers, developers, and product owners, will extract nuggets of opportunity. Usually these are key observations or pain points. They'll log it into our UX repository, tagged with contextual information, such as the magnitude, its experience factor, and frequency of the issues heard. On a quarterly basis, the larger team comes together, and we like to include teammates outside of product as well, to do an insights workshop for each of the focus working group and their personas. This entails plotting all of the recent nuggets from the repository collected across multiple projects, health systems, countries, and users on a board, and grouping them into like themes or problem statements. This is the stage where we consider each opportunity area ascertaining their value and, align and alignment with our organizational strategies, and also when the team aligns on where to focus and the goal to achieve. To brainstorm ways to achieve a goal, the team uses story mapping to understand ideas in a holistic way that captures the entire user story and experience, including the assumptions made for each step of the process. Each member contributes several of these and brings them to a group discussion to align on which to move forward with and to validate the assumptions, checking in with our users and partners, 
to reduce the risk of building an unsuccessful feature. So in this example, the problem to solve is that training users on updates to the CHD is difficult and expensive. Our goal is to reduce the need for in-person training by half. The feature being presented are training cards and how they might be deployed to end users with other actors and what their involvement is in the process. So we can see the role of a CHW, the supervisor, the administrator, um, and step-by-step -step what that user experience and story look like. Um, the aim is to start with a low risk MVP that can be tested and quickly deployed, further reducing the risk of spending time building the wrong thing. Once the story map assumptions have been validated, the next step in our process is to create prototype to test. It's much faster, easier, and cost-effective to make changes in the design phase rather than using fully developed flows. We have a comprehensive component library um, and icon library to leverage to ensure that we're always consistent in our UI and not reinventing the wheel for new experiences. Prototypes get tested against the same script and success metrics in person and remotely across different partners, countries, health systems, and personas to ensure that we're collecting equitable, diverse, and inclusive feedback. Here's an example of an in-person usability test. Our ideal setup is to have two cameras, one to record users and one to record close-ups of app interactions. This lets us watch all angles of reactions, any confusion or hesitations, speed of decision-making, etc., to cross-reference with our scripts and metrics. Generally, we ask users to imagine a scenario, give them a list of tasks to complete, and score the success of each design aspect on a table as we go to help streamline our synthesizing. We'll also usually couple usability testing with focus group discussions to get a more direct and fleshed out understanding of the challenges of the befores and uh, if our proposed after solution solves the pain point. Then we revise the designs as needed, build and deploy. Features are deployed with telemetry and that helps us track specific metrics where interviews are also conducted with preliminary users of features and logged in a separate monitoring database where nuggets of information or opportunities might arise and make their way back into our UX repository for further action or iterations. And that pretty much sums up our UX journey at Medic. We're focused on outcomes over outputs by building solutions from real needs through frequent touch points with actual users, by validating assumptions through design prototypes and user testing to reduce the risk of building the wrong thing, and measuring results to ensure that we're reaching the goals we've set out to achieve. Thanks. Thanks, Nicole. Uh, some exciting things coming out of the Medic team, and I'm sure we've got some questions for you uh, in a minute. But before we dive into that, we're going to hand across uh, to the OCL team to talk a little bit more about their experience with the same topic. All right. Thank you, Carl. And hi, everybody. Uh, as I said before, my name is Joe Amlung. I am a product owner with the Open Concept Lab, and I'm going to talk you through a little bit about our UX journey. So I think it first helps to set the stage a little bit about what can you do with a terminology service like Open Concept Lab. The overall goal is to help your organization to effectively manage their health data standards and eventually to exchange health information. So I've got some example use cases over here where you might be uh, looking for definitions, you might be publishing your local codes, you might map your data to a reference vocabulary, and a few other use cases. One in particular is collaborating with the community. Uh, now, this may or may not sound simple in theory, but in practice, it certainly isn't. Terminology management isn't always the most inviting field, and it can be pretty intimidating for implementers or the users of content. We want to help users feel more comfortable with these use cases here when they want to create and dive into terminology content. So there are existing tools geared towards high income settings that do do this, but they don't often land as well. You often need to have this terminology 
capacity and sophisticated use case already. And that's not always the case in the global context. And that's actually what led to the creation and maintenance of OCL, a tool that was specifically designed for lower capacity markets. So OCL has this very cool API that uh, has been available for many years and it's been used for publishing and accessing terminologies, but interfacing with an API often isn't inviting. So we went ahead and put a user face interface on top of it, which would allow you to do a lot of the technical things in OCL's API without having to go to the API yourself. And that should be enough, right? Well, not really. Uh, the user interface was kind of limited. Even though it was less technical, it uh, wasn't always intuitive. But people still need terminology management. They still need to be able to view the, this content. So we actually had some of our partners that started experimenting and sometimes even designing and building user interfaces for their own purposes that would connect to OCL's backend. So I'm going to give a little bit of an introduction to just a couple of those examples. Uh, one is Ethiopia National Health Data Dictionary mobile browser, which allowed health officers to find diagnosis codes, even if they're offline in the field. This is great for a newer terminology consumer who wants to get familiar with their NHDD. We at the OCL team saw this and said, great, this sounds wonderful. We love the idea of people browsing terminology content from a mobile phone. Well, then there was another idea, the Malawi terminology dashboard. And this was a dedicated website with Ministry of Health grant branding that makes an authoritative home for Malawi's terminology content so it can be searched and browsed. And at the OCL team said, great, another browser for OCL's terminology content. We love to see people embracing this. Well, then there was the PEPFAR metadata sharing platform, which streamlined browsings of PEPFAR's complicated MER metadata in a format that's familiar to the PEPFAR community. Another thing great for consumers of PEPFAR's reporting guidelines. And we at the OCL team are kind of excited to see this, but the, we're also seeing that this is another user interface to maintain based off of OCL. There's also the OpenMRS Dictionary Manager, which is a specialized tool for OpenMRS implementers to manage their concept dictionaries in the cloud and take advantage of data standards created by the global community. And we, again, at the OCL team, we love to see this, but we're getting worried. <laughs> Will it be sustainable to keep up all these UIs? And then upcoming the WHO Smart Guidelines Content Manager. So, we're getting very worried at this point. We've got lots of user interfaces. We've got lots of people that want to be using OCL, but the user interface that we had set up isn't really landing with the audience as well as we can hope. Even though people have been in good faith developing their own user interfaces and front ends, we need a more sustainable solution. So one of the things that we learned as part of this is that solving a technical problem such as standardization is not the same as making that technical solution work for a real world user. To be able to do that, OCL's user interface uh, needs to meet the needs of the audience and do it in a way that reduces complexity for users, especially for those unfamiliar with terminology management, which is quite a lot of people. But we needed to adopt more design oriented thinking. And one way we did that was uh, having a shared vision and going through collaboration and design. I've got just a few of many of our community participants in here, but there are many, many more across the OCL and the OpenHIE communities. So one way that OCL is embracing design oriented thinking is in the year of the user, which we've been doing for this past year. OCL has been embracing the user experience and design as a key part of everything that we're doing. And just some examples of the way we're doing that is embedding new UX team members into our team. We have been uh, co-creating with users via feedback groups. We've developed user personas to make sure we know who we're designing for. And we've set aside specific design initiatives to help have conversations around what we want to do with OCL. I do want to give an example of these user personas just because uh, this, these have given us a way to talk about users and to focus on specific needs so that we know what OCL is actually being designed for, what OCL should be able to do. I think we previously have been very focused on the terminology publisher on the far right, which requires a lot of terminology expertise to get to that level. 
but a lot of our users have really been the terminology consumers and implementers who don't have as much of that terminology management capacity, but that doesn't mean the need isn't there. So we are doing our best to develop for the uh, user personas that have less terminology management expertise and help to get that in implemented into their health architecture. So just to give some challenges that are being addressed with design thinking at OCL, we are often trying to change what happens when we are releasing new features into OCL's new user interface, one of which we're wanting to be more data-driven in our prioritization. I, I am personally very guilty of going with a gut feeling to say, here's how I think OC people are interfacing with OCL, but that's really not the case. And being data-driven can help us to have better prioritization and understand our audience better. We're also using collaborative design methods for community engagement. And this is something that'll happen throughout the development process and not just simply asking to users, does this work for you right before we are ready to release the features? We want to involve them in the process well before we get to that point. We also are having some design process ownership, which we previously had the risk of a feature that kind of just gets stuck in a limbo that we're, we're almost ready to release it, but it just needs some final tweaks. And it's hard to have that ownership and figure out when something is ready to cross the finish line. Our design process has really helped to move that along. So as far as what next, I want to say a little bit about some of OCL's upcoming initiatives, one of which is smart dictionaries. This idea that users can build and manage their dictionaries in a guided but uh, way that keeps the power in the hands of the users, and it lets them collaborate with the global community. There's also the OCL design system that we're putting together to have reusable components to ensure consistency throughout the app and also speed up our development. And then, of course, we want to continue being community driven in the way that we have been. We want to have users engaged throughout the process, including our end users, our engineers, our product owners, like all of these can come to the table at one time. And also, we are working on becoming more data driven so that we are truly understanding how people are using OCL in our main environment, which is OCL online. So I want to thank you, everybody, for the time. And Carl, I'll pass it back over to you. Thanks, Joe. That was great. Uh, again, another question for you to follow up. And before I dive into these, Roger, we'd love to hear your story from the owner's perspective on what you and your team have been taking on. But to give some context on what we do, so Ona has three products. Uh, Ona Data is for mobile surveys. Okuko is for data viz. And we have OpenSRP, which is a mobile healthcare platform for frontline health workers. So OpenSRP uh, has apps for community health workers to manage patient care. It has an app for facility workers for clinical decision making and, uh, and uh, kind of a desktop app for supervisors to monitor and kind of manage their, their workers. Um, so since 2014, we've built OpenSP. It's used now in several countries across Africa and Asia, uh, which we're pretty happy about. And then the design team at Ona uh, for OpenSP consists of uh, three product designers. Um, you can see them circled with a few of uh, project managers uh, who are, have little arrows next to them and the rest of Ona being mostly our, our tech team. Oops. Uh, so, you know, with that size design team and the number of products and projects we work on, uh, we follow an agile design process at Nona, which basically means that we collaborate, you know, and collaboration and embracing change are more important than following, you know, some sort of set plan. Um, so what we do is we try to have short term priorities instead of trying to anticipate everything and figure out all at, at like one phase. And then we're trying to be, you know, ready and flexible with design opportunities as they come up. Uh, so today, you know, I'll talk about some of the biggest challenges in our product work and where that agile design approach fits in. Um, you can let me know if any of this resonates with you. You know, first is the problem of, you know, I don't have the time or team to do design. Um, so I'll talk about how we at Ona find design time and resources. 
Second is, you know, everyone is asking for something and the feature list is, is ballooned. Um, so I'll talk about how we align our stakeholders. And then third is the team is getting distracted with blue sky ideas, solving edge cases, or thinking about, you know, only thinking about value to themselves. So the third is, you know, how do we focus on what's important, which is you know, end user experience. So first, how we find design time and resources. Uh, the first thing we do is we use design sprints. You know, a design sprint is a focused mini project you can finish in like a week or two, and it's dedicated towards a very immediate problem. So we tend to prioritize very risky problems, you know, the most unknown or the ones that can cause delays in engineering. Um, and we find that using sprints uh, gives us flexibility with the team's time, you know, depending on uh, who's available, we can adjust the sprint goals to match. The second thing we are is opportunistic. You know, we're, we are uh, try to be aware of any field visits happening either on our team or in our partner networks. And we can piggyback to test those questions uh, that, that anybody has. On short notice, we have ways to generate, you know, testing tools pretty quickly. Um, we use a design library in Figma to build fast prototypes. We also have used other software for testing in the past, such as Google Forms for data inputs or like WhatsApp to try out messaging flows. And um, another thing we like to do is onboard any, you know, anybody close to the end user uh, early on in the project um, so that they're all, you know, ready whenever, whenever there's something to test. You know, and the goal is really to increase the iterations rather than having perfect research. So an example there in the photo is, is someone in Indonesia uh, that we trained to, to gather input. Um, you know, our team's mentality is bad research beats no research. The next is how we align stakeholders. So um, the first thing we do here is to try to make a solution as real as possible for stakeholders. Uh, this means incorporating high fidelity prototypes or working prototypes as early as possible, even in like kickoff meetings. We find that this practice centers the conversation better around this tangible item rather than, you know, focusing on their own domain needs or, you know, looking at documents or wireframes or diagrams, which sometimes leave a lot of room for interpretation and the, the conversations then start to veer. Um, the next thing we do is try to highlight conflicts and then, you know, between stakeholders and then dig in. Um, at the start of projects, we try to normalize with partners and teams that, you know, they will have bias and they will have different goals. You know, even if everyone agrees on the overall goal of, you know, getting the software out or saving lives, people have different opinions on how that's done. So, you know, when this happens, when groups ask for different things, we flag it. Uh, we'll use some methods to kind of break it down. So five whys is one of those where it's used to discover the core needs. Um, and maybe, you know, at the end, they're trying to solve the same thing. Uh, and we'll use that core need to collaborate on a solution that, you know, everyone can agree on. Examples of this is something like the m and &E team versus the field team. Uh, you know, the data team might need a lot of data and, and the field team might you know, care about the ability of users, the time of the users. So that'll be kind of something to figure out. Uh, and the third is how we focus uh, on the end user, you know, what's important. Um, the first thing we do is prioritize end user pers the end user perspective and value. Um, note that the end user for us is anybody that uses the tools to do their job. So we try to make sure this value is established early with clients and we use it to factor, as a factor for prioritizing work. Um, many times for us, the version one, you know, the only goal should really be about adoption and everything else is kind of useless without that. So uh, we'll highlight choices that disrupt adoption, like requests that would make processes really slow for the user beyond what they do now, or tries to overly control what users can do. We kind of try to highlight those for everybody. The next thing is just involving those impacted in the decision making. So. We'll try to get input from end users and have stakeholders get involved in listening, you know, and try to document it for them if they can't join in person. Uh, this shows stakeholders what they can 
realistically expect rather than what they hoped happen or think should happen. Uh, the goal is to avoid those top-down decisions that lead to kind of an unreasonable situation in the field or when, when things scale. Uh, so just in summary, you know, Ono's UX is really favors collaboration over planning. Um, try to fit in design work wherever possible. We build collaboration early among stakeholders and then we ensure end users are represented well. Thanks. Thanks, Roger. Uh, thanks, everybody, for taking a few moments and just sharing your journeys as you've gone through this particular space. Uh, quite a challenging area in many areas uh, to look at. How do you bring this thinking into your organizations? Grace, a question for you. What are some of the larger challenges and next steps that you and the OpenMRS team are looking at to both address and take forward? Thanks, Carl. Yeah, so um, in as I mentioned earlier, when you don't include the whole team, when you don't think about your team as a whole team, you tend to uh, neglect inviting the right people to the right party early on in your design process. Um, now, uh, you, you saw earlier in our in our UX journey at, at OpenMRS, the process that we've been applying now has this kind of diagrammed process where there's a pre-development design phase. The danger there is very similar to what the QA quality assurance industry faces, where the team imagines there being an invisible wall in between different teams. I do my work as uh, to gather requirements, to build the designs, and then I throw them over the wall to the development team. And then they might do the development and then they throw that over the wall to the QA team and say, bye, you know, hope it works out well. And uh, each team then suffers um, because for example, if the requirements are not clear, if the business context is not clear, it's hard for the designers to optimize a workflow that really makes sense for the user and industry context. Same is true for the engineers. We might end up with a solution that doesn't well fit our architecture. And often our engineering colleagues are really creative, smart people too. And so we miss out on hearing their ideas. And finally, um, same thing is true in, in quality assurance where you've got a team at the end of the pipe who are suffering with broken things and no one to really talk to but everyone sees them as the release blocker so the same thing can happen in design and um making this whole process feel more like a, a donut, a, a circular process that we all go through together in smaller steps rather than a big waterfall process where, um, you know, we do a whole chunk of designs and then hope they'll get finished up at the end of a big process. That's what we're trying to uh, uh, componentize and make a smaller uh, piece by piece experience that we're all involved in. Thanks. So that's really breaking it down into some smaller pieces and rather than just leaving it at the end, bringing it together. I, I really look at that here. Uh, yeah, uh, Joe, do you have a question around that or something you'd like to dive in with, Grace, on that? I actually just wanted to add in to something that Grace said, because I, I think, Grace, you mentioned earlier that uh, involving engineers throughout the process is something that can really, really uh, bring out your opportunities and make sure that things don't get missed. Uh, something we do with the OCL team is that we make sure the engineers are aware of all of our design initiatives and our priorities and things like that. And it's not uncommon that we will say, all right, here's something we want to solve. Here's what we want to develop. And our engineer is able to connect dots between our uh, different initiatives and say, oh, well, we can get two birds with one stone here. So I definitely co-sign on getting your engineers involved even before you need them to start developing. And building off of this, Roger, I know that the uh, owner and open SRP team are going through a really exciting time now with uh, pivoting to a fire native backend. You know, this is quite an interesting aspect considering it's a really a backend change of, of your data stores, but with some positive impacts in the front end. How has design shown up in this process for you? Sure. We're, it's actually, uh, re, we're redoing everything. The front end is also going to be more configurable driven rather than kind of more custom where it was before. So um, good question. <laughs> so this is, we're, we're super excited about this native fire native transition, but it is incredibly complex because uh, it's one of the first or the first fire native app that's out there. Um, so it's a lot of R&D going down paths and backtracking and reevaluating things. I'm just trying to figure out how to integrate things like care plans and how to make things configurable. Um, we're also working with you know, partners like WHO Smart Guidelines and, and Google to build components of the app. So you know, working with those partners, it's really 
uh, reaffirmed our commitment to this collaborative approach and tried to solve issues as they come rather than trying to have this really long design phase where we try to anticipate all the problems up front. Um, we really aren't able to do that. So, you know, we're really excited to do this. <laughs> we hope this is the next generation, like technical foundation for health apps, but it is, it is uh, been, been good. But uh, the, the process, um, our design process has really um, helped us do this. Fantastic. And Nicole, I know you, your team at Medic has done a lot of work in terms of asking and engaging with your users as well as your, your developers, your, your community really, um, and doing, dare I say, like a retrospective review of what could and what positive impacts uh, you could be making in the design space. What are some of the exciting things that we can look forward to uh, that your team is coming up with uh, for the foreseeable future? I have a lot of exciting updates. Um, I'm very, very, very excited for the next year with Medic and the CHT because a lot of the things we've uncovered through our continuous discovery process, and like you said, speaking to the community um, very regularly, and also touching on what Grace mentioned earlier, um, noticing things in person that you wouldn't with just a phone call, uh, huge, huge things. So we've been spending a lot of time just updating the CHT to meet um like material design standards and be more aligned with other android experiences but we're really excited to start to take action on things that will make the app better for health workers and i mean that in the sense that sometimes they're a, like a little bit older and have bad eyesight some most of the times they're working outside what does that look like when they're looking at their screen and there's like a huge glare and really hard for them just to use the device in direct sunlight all day. Um, so, you know, being able to think about being more proactive and really making the CHT a delight to use for end users and not just being a tool that helps them do their work. Nicole, thanks for that. Uh, you raised a really interesting point that's just triggered from uh, something with me here is uh, you mentioned eyesight and that that tends to get me to ask the question, are there any key thoughts or golden nuggets that this team wants to share with the community around how are you being inclusive in your thought patterns around design and what are the value propositions for the broader community of a good design process? We are being intentional in inclusivity by making sure we're talking to all types of personas across many different projects, across many different counties and countries and health systems. And you should see what our UX repository database looks like. It's just like, insights from everywhere, some of them asking for things you would never think about, but um, really being mindful to be inclusive to everyone who uses the CHT that way. Yeah, one thing I wish we had um, planned for earlier, but that certainly came up almost right away anyway, was the need for translators. If you're going to do remote pandemic style uh, user testing, uh, then you need translators ready. But the other piece uh, that we discovered in the field, which also maybe goes without saying, it is nice if you can have someone there, not only as a translator, but as a broker for the relationship, because not every user will truly tell you their real situation situation unless you are with an ambassador type person that they trust, that they have a pre-existing uh, trusted relationship with. Um, the other thing that we've discovered, and Nicole, I love the way you described reaching across programs, is that that importance of uh, reviewing uh, folks, both testing your assumptions, um, doing user testing across multiple countries and different types of funding streams. For example, we uh, did a UX study both in uh, an East African country where the site was primarily funded around HIV AIDS, and then other ones were done in an Asian country uh, where it was more government primary health funded. And the workflows were dramatically different and had a huge impact on how we were thinking about uh, the program. So be really careful if all of your uh, user testing is being done within not just the same country or language group, but also within the same program area. You might find that your solution ends up being overly specific to that workflow.
I, I Carl, going back to your question, I think something uh, that design has really kind of opened my eyes with is that uh, when we are putting our process together, we're uh, trying to make sure we're not making assumptions that will prevent users from being able to actually make good use of this. Uh, in the space of terminology management, there are tools available, but they kind of have these inherent assumptions that you've got local capacity and that uh, you may already have a sophisticated use case with terminology. And uh, in my mind, design thinking helps to break down those kind of inherent assumptions and make sure that we're meeting users where they're at and not furthering that digital divide. We're making tools that actually can be used uh, for people who really want to get started with this, but you know may not necessarily have the a uh, robust starting point that someone in a uh, high income setting might have. All right. Well, I think as we look at the session here, uh, and I really appreciate everybody's time that we've had today, you know, we've had some really valuable conversations. And I do want to finish with trying to draw one last nugget out of each of you right now, as we consider really this question, you know, what are some of the practical activities uh, that, that we can try in our organizations uh, to really start implementing this. It's something that I've heard a little bit around and thought through um, to bring this together is ask the people we don't normally talk to. Uh, really be beyond the engineers or the edge focus users or you know, the stakeholders, but make sure you get a holistic view and be cognizant of introducing your own bias into the space. So really try to break that out. And that comes from a, a how will I say, a lapsed technologist uh, and something I'd be excited to hear through. But Grace, Nicole, Joe, Roger, what are some of those takeaways and uh, would you like to expand on your points here? Yeah, go to the field, take any opportunity you can. And um, by the way, it's it's an organizational culture, the uh, prioritizing time with real users. I've uh, welcomed engineers onto my team in the past. Some came from teams at the time where the culture was, yeah, like, let me find a shadowing opportunity for you so you can see the software at work. And you will probably notice as an engineer, oh, there's all these like low hanging things I can fix that would really improve the experience. Um, but I've also worked with engineers who came from team cultures where that was not even discussed. It wasn't an option. And that can really change your team dynamic and how you approach solving problems together. So uh, invest in that culture shift uh, because putting users first and finding even short time periods, a couple of sessions a year if you're not a, an in the field designer still find time to do that in person time with your users fantastic thanks race nicole from your perspective what would you add to that uh well firstly i completely agree with grace um super important to embrace that culture um i want to emphasize speaking to your users all the time um, I put at least once a week on this slide. I think that's a good uh, benchmark to aim for. But honestly, like we talk to our colleagues every day. We speak to our partners quite frequently. But really, the only people who have the answers to des did your design work are the users. So talk to them as uh, often as you can. That's a great point. <laughs> Joe, from your perspective. Yeah, so I wanted to give a kind of specific activity that we've tried that uh, we felt had a lot of a lot of success because it generates fresh ideas. It's called the round robin activity, and it's essentially it's like a little bit of a game of telephone where everybody starts by drawing up their ideas to solve a particular solution. And what it does is rather than one person bringing to the table their idea and we iterate off of that. It's everybody brings these fresh ideas that uh, we can start building up off of. And we've now come up with multiple different solutions that wouldn't have come up if you know we just had a single designer come in with a proposed solution. So I uh, would definitely recommend, you know, this is a way to bring in multiple members of your team and get multiple perspectives in a relatively short time frame. It's a great point, Joe, and a lovely tangible activity for teams to try as they look at this. Uh, Roger, as you round us out for this question today, what are some of your thoughts in this space? Uh, thanks, Earl. Uh, yeah, um, I think, you know, just touching on, you know, what I was talking about with our Yogg's journey about just kind of trying to be scrappy uh, with uh, design, you know, research. Um, I'd like to recommend just building a design trust uh, with 
whoever you can identify that really cares about UX quality um, and just getting the UX, uh, the WhatsApp of the people you encounter in the field. It's a pretty informal way to get feedback. Uh, I, I do it a lot just because, you know, like during projects, it's a lot of pressure and things are very planned and structured, but uh, getting the UX, WhatsApp of users, um, it's kind of an inf informal way to get quick feedback or any ideas you have. You could bounce off, you know, ideas off of them. Um, I think it's a great way to uh, kind of build that that network of people that you can talk to about design. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you, everybody, for those really exciting opportunities and, and ideas of bringing this forward. Um, and for those of you who are in the session and looking to dive a little deeper into these questions, please feel free to get hold of any of the participants that have been part of this panel. Uh, you'll see that their email addresses are below their names here. And we just want to take a moment and thank each of you for choosing the session, taking some time out. And we hope that at the end of this, you understand the value that of design thinking and that there are teams that are working in the space of putting it into their process. And we want to have an open invitation to you to ask us, pester us, ask these hard questions and let us have learned the lessons so that you don't have to. So thank you, everyone. Thanks to the panelists today. It has been an amazing opportunity to work with each and every one of you uh, in the session. And we hope you have a fantastic rest of the conference. Goodbye, all.